Well, thank you, Danny. Thank you, worship team, for leading us and uh, just preparing our time to receive God's Word today. Um, we are getting back into the book of Nehemiah, um, chapter 4 today. As you saw, Terry Porter, he's going to be uh, doing chapter 5 with us next week, and we're excited for that. We're excited for the time that he spends with our church staff as well on Friday and Saturday, and then we're going to be able to get to spend some time with him on Sunday. So we're excited for that. Um, but hey, before we get into God's Word today, I just want to say, um, here at our church, we reach youth and we honor age, don't we? And um, there is a couple in our church, and they're not here with us because of so many health reasons right now, but uh, you guys all know Bill and Ann very well, I think, right? Yeah, over these last few weeks, we've taken some time to collect um, just just some items for them, and uh, Diana Baker has this huge gift bag that she's filled up that we were going to try and give them to, to today if they were here, but uh, Bill's been in and out of the hospital um, with, with different issues, and, um, and so they weren't able to be here with us today, but we wanted just to, to say to them, if they watch online, and, and for all of us collectively as a church, we want to say a huge thank you to them, okay? So why don't we, on the count of three, just do that. that. Sound good to Bill and Ann? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. You may be wondering why we're why are we saying thank you to them? Well, for the last I don't even know how many years it's been. Probably ten. Has it been that long? Close. Um, they were our custodian team here at the church, and uh, recently Ann and Bill decided to retire. And um, man, what a huge blessing they have been making sure that this church facility is ready for not only us, but for people in this valley to come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. And so we want to um, show some appreciation to them. We've got a monetary gift that we're going to be giving to them uh, as a church. And, um, and then all the things that you guys have collected, we're going to be bringing over to their house at some point this week to just say a huge thank you to them. And uh, so, so that is something that uh, we want to uh, just recognize right now as, as a church. The other thing is, be in prayer for this. Um, we're going to be um, just starting our, our search for that part-time position um, of, of custodian. And so if you have any recommendations um, of people that you would love to you know, be a part of that, that team, um, we would love to hear it. You can come to myself or any of the elders and let us know. We've been uh, just this week just re-looking at the job description for that. It's part-time. It's about 10 to 15 hours a week. And, um, but uh, we're looking for someone that God will use to help prepare this facility for people to come in and hear the gospel of Jesus. So that's what it's all about. But why don't we pray? We're going to get into God's Word today. Nehemiah chapter 4 today, if, you, if you've got your Bibles. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful Lord, uh, first of all, we, we, as we've recognized Bill and Ann, we're thankful so much for them and for the work that they've put into uh, this church facility, God. God, we pray that you would bless them, that you would watch over them, and God, that especially for Bill, Lord, that you would heal him. Lord, he's been battling with cancer over this last year. Um, Lord, you, you've been, been bringing him and been so faithful to him, God, but we just, we just need you to just be, and be their strength, surround them during this time, and Lord, help us as a church to encourage them and love them. God, um, we pray that uh, you would teach us this morning as we go to your word. Lord, we, we've got a, a really interesting chapter, Lord, that uh, really was unexpected after chapter 3. But God, as, as we read it, as we understand your word, God, help us to learn from it and be changed by it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, hey, if you got your Bibles, um, again, those Bibles in our pews are yours to take if you don't have a Bible. But we want to encourage you, open up your Bible to, and I didn't get the page number. If anybody finds Nehemiah chapter 4, you want to yell out the page number for us? 400! Hey, there we go. Okay, that is a great number. That's an easy number. 400. Page 400 in your Bibles, um, at least if it's in the Pew Bible, okay? The worship team this morning taught us a song, didn't they? They, they, uh, they taught us this song, New Wine, and, and the line... Uh, lines from the song, the lyrics for the song go like this. In the crushing, 
in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. Okay, this, this seems painful, right? This seems hard. You're breaking new ground, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Today, as, as, we, as we approach chapter 4 of Nehemiah, I, I, I reflect on the lyrics of this song because the song that the worship team taught us this morning is, is actually a, a great reflection on, on what God does in us through seasons of difficulty, the crushing, the pressing. We, we, we've been talking in this series about things that God places on our heart that are painful, that are hurtful, where, where, where our pain and our passion aligns with God's heart. You've got to go through pain to be passionate about something, right? When it, whenever you feel that stir in your spirit, remember it, it's, it's produced somewhere, and usually it's from a pain point in your life. And what we remember is that when Jesus brings about a pain point in our life, a crushing, a pressing, he's making new wine. He's doing something within us, something that is deeper and greater and more beautiful than what we could ever imagine just looking at or just experiencing it in the moment, especially as we yield to him and to his hand in things that we don't understand. You may be going through something right now, today, this week. I don't know what it is. Yield to him in the things you don't understand. He's making new wine. And as we come to Nehemiah chapter 4, we see God doing just that. So Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. If we only had chapter 3, chapter 3 last week was pretty good, eh? I mean, Nehemiah had a plan, right? He, he, first they consecrated the walls, and then, and then they just got to work. And one after the other after the other, got the walls built, got the gates built, and this family and that family and that family. And if we only had chapter 3, we would have thought, they just built the wall, and there was no problems at all, right? That's what we would think, right? But as we look at chapter 4, 5, and 6, we're going to see that there is actually a different story. <laughs> Things weren't easy. Thing, there, was, there was conflict. There was hardship. Um, there were rumors going around. There was opposition. Um, that's the case in life, Right? Things are never the way that they look like on the surface, right? So, some people, you, you may come to, come to church and you may be like, wow, this is a perfect church, right? Okay, can I just tell you, there is no perfect church because if we were a perfect church, um, we wouldn't be reaching anybody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'd just be a bunch of self-righteous Pharisees, okay? That, that's not what we want here in this church. There is no perfect church, Okay, and it's the same with any other, any other place where you see something awesome going on. There's usually difficulty and hardship going on underneath the surface that we're trying to yield to the Lord and to his faithful hand and trying to trust him in it, okay? And, and as, as, as we look at the wall, that's what the case was. So prob- chap- chapters, chapters 4 through 6 show us that there was problems that had to be overcome in order to keep the wall being rebuilt. And so I've titled my message today, Opposition. And if you have your sermon notes, um, you can can, um, follow along with that. I've got, uh, I think, four main points. And and what what we see as we look at Nehemiah chapter 4 is that whenever you try to accomplish something great for the Lord, Satan is going to come and he's going to try to stop it. Okay, we got to be ready for opposition. You know, you know the, the name Satan, Satan's name, it means adversary, right? And so, so, so just based upon his name, he, he, his, his whole motive is to stop the things that God is trying to do. And so Nehemiah chapter 4 teaches us that when the enemy opposes us, we should respond with prayer, with work, with watching, 
and with faith in the Lord. That's my message in a nutshell this morning. We're going to see it from the text. With prayer, with work, with watching, and with faith in the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read it together if you got your Bibles. And I am using the ESV translation here this morning if, um, if you're following along in, on your phone or in the Pew Bible. It says this, Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. Okay, now who, who is this Sanballat? Okay, we, we've, we've heard about this story. Nehemiah comes back to the city of Jerusalem. The walls have been broken down, burned with fire. Um, about 150 years they've been broken down. And he comes and, and he gets the people to start rebuilding the wall. Okay, and there's opposition. Sanballat and Tobiah are two, two men that are mentioned in, in this text, along with some others. But Sanballat had, had actually a, a stake in this game because he was the, the governor of Samaria. And he was furious about Nehemiah coming back and getting the Jews to start rebuilding the wall. See, see Jerusalem was actually a, a part of his trade route. And so it, it threatened his whole economy. If, if his trade route was compromised, then he wouldn't make all the money that he wanted to make. Okay, he, he had kind of a monopoly in, in that area during that time. And, and so, so Sanballat was, was upset. He was furious. And in verse 2, he begins to mock them. See what he says. He said in the presence of his brothers and the army of, of Samaria, what, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? So, so, so he's mocking them. Let's, let's look at a few things that he says. He says, will they sacrifice? Will they sacrifice? He has this idea he's mocking them for trusting in the Lord. He said, are, are they just going to offer sacrifices to God and expect that he's going to rebuild the walls? That, that God is just going to do it for them? It's, it's uh, kind of kind of like when, when people, people mock you for, for praying. It's like, it's like, you know, is, is just praying going to get it done? You know, is, is God just going to do it because you prayed? You know, are you going to pray the walls up, right? Is that what you're going to do? And he's mocking them about that. He, he also says this, will they finish in a day? Will they finish in a day? He, he's basically saying, do you realize how massively huge this project is? Are you crazy? Are you nuts? I mean, you're, you're just a bunch of peasants that don't know what they're doing. You'd have no engineers, no tradesmen that actually, actually have, have the knowledge and the skill to do this. You don't even have the tools you need. How do you expect to get this work done? Are you crazy? Okay, what, what, was, what was his intent? Discouragement, intimidation, fear. That was his intent, okay? And like, like most attacks of discouragement, and we, we can take this for ourselves, there are usually traces of truth found within that discouragement. Think about ways that you've been discouraged before, okay? Yes, the builders were unskilled. They didn't have the skills. No, they were not going to complete it in a day. This was not, not going to be an overnight project. And yeah, they did not have the best materials to work with. Okay, Discouraging attacks often come with truth mixed into them. But it neglects the greater truth. What had God promised? God had promised, I am with you. I'm, 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 I'm going to see you through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I've divinely planned for these walls to be rebuilt, so be faithful and be obedient to me. And Nehemiah had sought the Lord, they had sought the Lord, they had consecrated their work to the Lord. But they were sought, the Sanballat was, was seeking to discourage them. Then Tobiah, um, verse 3, if you keep on going, Tobiah the Ammonite uh, thought about throwing in another sarcastic jab, okay? Here's what, here's what Tobiah said. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yeah, I mean, what they are building? If a fox goes up on the wall, 
He'll break it down. He'll, he'll, he'll break down their stone wall, okay? What's he saying? He's saying, your wall is so pitiful that even if a light little fox goes and jumps upon the wall, it's just going to fall over. It's going to crumble, okay? It's kind of like a jab. And, and there are probably all these soldiers probably all around like, yeah, 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 that's hilarious. And it's not really that funny, but, you know, <laughs> that's what they're doing, okay? It was to them. It was to them, okay? But I want you to see something in, in, in verse 3. Because Tobiah made a huge mistake in talking about their stone wall. What do you call it? He said, their wall. Their wall. You see that? He will break down their stone wall. Whose wall was it? It was the Lord's. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't their wall at all. It was God's wall. He was criticizing God's wall. He was criticizing God's work. In church, this is something that has direct application over to, over to the local church. Because sometimes we like to wear these, these t-shirts that say, I love my church, right? Let's not get that wrong. We love our church, okay? But it's not our church. It's God's church. It's his church. And, and, and you may not like what's happening in God's church, but let's be careful that we don't criticize God's bride, okay? Too often, sometimes we get frustrated with the people that are in church, and I guarantee you that the more messy church gets, the more people that are far from Jesus that come into this church, the more we're going to have an opportunity to be like, man, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Like, they, they really don't know what, it's, what it means to follow Jesus. But seriously, guys, let's be careful. Do not criticize God's bride. It's not our church. It's his church. He loves his bride. He even, he even loves his bride that, that he, he gives this illustration. He loves the harlot, right? His bride is a harlot, and that is, that is what we are. If, if we're honest with ourselves, that is who we are. We're loving other gods. We're seeking other things. We come here on Sunday and we put on a good show and then then we go home and we love love things that are not the Lord. We love our own life. We're seeking the American dream. We're we're, we're pursuing pursuing our own advancement rather than advancement than than God's kingdom. We're a harlot. But yet he loves his bride. He loves his bride. Be careful. Don't criticize what is the God's. He made a huge mistake. He called it their wall. It wasn't their wall. It was God's wall, okay? Keep on going. What does God promise? What does God promise? I believe that God promises when we think about our church, when we think about God's church, he says this, 1 Corinthians 127, God chooses what is foolish, what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose, chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Why does God do that? Well, again, I think, think it goes back to what we talked about last week. They were seeking the glory of God. God makes things so that he will be glorified. And so he uses weak things. He uses insignificant things for his glory so that people might point to him. People would be like, man, they, they couldn't have done that themselves. Just like the Jews, they couldn't have done that themselves, built that wall all by themselves. No way. Pointing to the glory of God. There's no other explanation. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, says this. He said, uh, and I think this is Paul speaking. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Church, we're a messy, broken people who have been redeemed. What does redeem mean? We've been taken from our broken state and we've been made new, okay? So, some, of you, some of you guys like, um, like restoration shows on HGTV. Does that even exist anymore? Did they get bought out? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have cable. Some of you guys like, like those home remodel shows, okay? What do they do with the home? They take all that plaster, they tear it down, they put up drywall, they, they put up nice light fixtures and get nice furniture in there and flooring and, and everything, and boom, it's restored, okay? It's been redeemed. Something that was got messed up, and now they rebuilt it. 
but it takes money, it takes time, it takes people to do it, okay? And just, th- that's the same for us. Once we were perfect, once, once we were sinless, once we were holy and in perfect relationship with God, and in a moment, sin entered into the world, and our relationship with God was broken. Adam and Eve, they chose to disobey God. And every time that you sin, you say, God, here's what I think of you. I'm going to go my own way, right? That's what we do. And so we need a Savior. We need Jesus to come and redeem us, restore our relationship back to God. And that is what we see in those stones, those broken stones. God cho- chooses what is burned, what is broken, what is damaged, and he redeems it. He builds it back again. And that's all through Jesus Christ, his work. Something impossible for us. We want to be that kind of church that promotes that, that are about God redeeming broken, burned stones. For honest, that's each one of us. You've got to come to a place where you realize that we're broken, burned, damaged stones. And God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. Weakness. So, as we keep on going here, we see that Satan likes to discourage, likes to sidetrack us. Here's the other thing that I see in, in, in what was going on, that the enemy also loves to condemn those who have legal protection from the king of kings. What were Sanballat and Tobiah trying to do? Think about it. They were trying to discourage the people from their work. But in Nehemiah chapter 2, we learn that king, the king actually wrote letters protecting Nehemiah and all the workers legally so that they actually had permission, they, they, they were commissioned to do the work of rebuilding the walls, didn't they? And so all that Sanballat and Tobiah could do was, was discourage them and, and hopefully discourage them enough, their goal was to get them to stop their work. Think about that. The enemy loves to condemn those who have legal protection from the king of kings. Let me, let me just tell you this. Don't let Satan discourage you. Satan may discourage you and say, you're the weakest. Your past disqualifies you. Or you're never going to overcome that sin. You're always going to struggle with that. Here, here's what you need to tell Satan. When he says you're the weakest, tell him, tell him what the word of God says about you. Right? It says, it, says, it says in scripture, when I am weak, he is strong. You're disqualified. Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are not disqualified. Christ has qualified you through the blood of his cross. He has redeemed you. He has bought you back. He has brought you into his kingdom. You are not disqualified if you've placed your faith in Jesus because it's not about you. Okay? Satan may say, you're never going to overcome that sin. Tell him. Tell him what scripture says. Romans 8 verse 2. For in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You don't have to live discouraged anymore. Submit to God. Submit to his spirit. He will let you overcome that sin. The enemy loves to condemn those who have legal protection from the king of kings. Like Sanballat and Tobiah were trying to discourage the Jews from their work. They could only discourage, don't stop, don't stop. You've got legal protection from the king of kings. And, 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 and here's the other thing. Don't be surprised when opposition comes because the devil, the devil loves to bother those who are a threat to his kingdom. He doesn't bother those who are not a threat, right? He doesn't. He doesn't. So the greater the opposition against you, the greater the opportunity for God to fight for you. And so we're going we're gonna to see that here in this next section. How should you respond to opposition? Well, you can run from it, you can dodge it, you can try to go around it, or you can face it head on. And, and, and that's, what way they, that's what they did. They lifted their voices in prayer, they put their hands to work, they kept watch for the enemy, and they put their faith in the Lord. Okay, we're going to go to verse 4. Verse 4, okay? As we keep on going, we see that they first lifted their voice in prayer. Verse 4 says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own hands 
and give them up to be plundered in the land that they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. What did they do first? If you're taking notes, they lifted their voices in prayer. They lifted their voices in prayer. And this is an example. When we face opposition, what should we do? We should lift our voice in prayer. Often, our response when we face opposition is to, in our own strength, just get angry and want to defend ourselves. But instead of going low, Nehemiah goes high, right? That's what he did. Instead of going low, go high. First response should always be prayer. John Bunyan, famous missionary and evangelist, wisely observed this. He said, you can do more, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more. You cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Think about it again. You can do more. So you can get to work. You can, you can get stuff done after you've prayed. But you cannot do more until you have prayed. Pray first. Pray first. Now, the other thing that, that this came up in our life group uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, someone asked a question about this prayer that Nehemiah prayed. And um, I just, just side note. If you're not part of life group yet, I want to encourage you. It's not too late to jump in on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. Um, grab a study guide. We would love to see you there and be a part of that um, because we're growing. We're growing deeper in our love for God and our understanding of Scripture and our obedience to Him. And uh, we want you to be part of that community. That's what church is all about. Someone asked this question about, about Nehemiah's prayer because it doesn't, doesn't go along with this, like, um, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you kind of, kind of, um, kind of line of thinking. Um, should we pray like Nehemiah prayed? It's a good question, right? That's what they asked. Should, you know, is this, like, is this something that we should do? Like, should we pray like Nehemiah prayed? Well, what Nehemiah was praying remember, was not personal vengeance. Rather, he's praying, God, would you judge sinners? Would you establish your kingdom? And would you destroy those who hinder your work? Now, first of all, we've got to guard our hearts from selfish motives when we pray. Okay, let's get that right. But as Christians, we should first pray, God, would you destroy our enemies by converting them? Think about that. Those that are enemies of the church, those are enemies of the cross. Let's pray, God, would you destroy them by converting them? But also, we don't think it's wrong, as Scripture gives us this example. God, if, if, if they are unwilling to convert, if, if your spirit has not done that work in their hearts, and if they were just opposed to your kingdom and your purposes, God, we pray that you would be faithful to what you said, and you would be wrathful and just with them, in that they, they receive what they have coming. It is not wrong to pray that way. And that's what Nehemiah was praying. They were opposing God's work. They're opposing God's work. He's saying, God, would you, would you enact your justice upon them? Now, obviously, our first, first, first thing that we should do is, God, would you give them your mercy and grace through Christ? Would you convert them? But if they don't, God, would, would you keep your work going forward? forward by stopping them. And that's what Nehemiah was doing, okay? So, how should you respond to opposition? First thing, if you're taking notes, lift your voice in prayer, okay? Second thing, and these next few points are going to go pretty quick. Put your hands to work. Put your hands to work. We saw last week that they consecrated their work to the Lord, and then they went about their systematic work, right? And it's kind of the same thing. They put their hands to work. It says in Nehemiah 4, verse 6, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. I've heard it said before, and I don't know where it comes from. So, so forgive me, but, but it's probably a number of people that have said this. Pray as if everything depends on God, and work as if everything depends on you. 
Pray as if, as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. And, and that's what they did. They got to work. The people had a heart to work. And pretty soon, the enemy that was across the wall, that was probably, you know, they were looking, looking across and they were, they were making jokes at them and, and uh, jeering at them and, and making fun of them and trying to discourage them. Pretty soon, that wall was built up so that what? Couldn't see him anymore, right? That's right. They built it up. It was joined together to about half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now, you would think that the attacks would stop after that. They didn't. Keep on going. Nehemiah 4, 7, verse 7. It says, When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry, and they all plotted to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God, and we set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Nehemiah prayed first, they got to work, and they set a guard. They set a guard. They didn't let opposition stop them from their work. And, and, and here's something to remember. In our work, we use both a sword and a shovel, right? We, we've heard of God's word being, being referred to as, as a sword, right? And it is. It is. It, 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 can, it, it is, it is an offensive weapon against the attacks of the enemy. And, and we see that already this morning when Satan was trying to discourage us, saying, you're, you're the weakest, right? You're, you're, you're disqualified. What do we do? We answer it with the sword. Okay? Our, our weapon of offense. Okay? But we also, we also use, use the shovel. We defend the faith with the sword of God's word. And we build his kingdom with the shovel. Okay? So the reason we use the sword is so that we can use the, sh- use the shovel. And, and that's what we see Nehemiah and his team doing here. How do we sp- respond to opposition? You lift your voice in prayer. You put your hands to work. And third, you keep watch for the enemy. This is some interesting stuff, okay? Oliver Cromwell is quoted to have said, trust God and keep your powder dry. And that's what they did. Verse verse 15 (coughs) says, When our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, Half of the servants worked on construction, and half held the spears and shields and bows and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders had a sword strapped to his side while he built. The man, the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is great and it's widely spread and we're separated on the wall from each other. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work and half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men nor the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Now, that's a long portion of scripture, but, but you see what's happening. They were serious. And they were like, we are not going to leave until this wall is built. Because, because the attacks of the enemy are imminent. They're serious. We're going to take them serious. So we're going to hold our spear and our sword. And we're going to hold our, our, our armor. And we're going to sleep here at night with, without, without getting undressed and, and going into our jammies, we're, we're going to stay dressed and ready for battle so that, that there is no chance that the enemy can get in. Okay? They trusted God, and they kept their powder dry. That's what they did. How do you respond to opposition? 
Lift your voice in prayer. Put your hands to work. And keep watch for the enemy. Fourth way that we respond to opposition is this. You put your faith in the Lord. Put your faith in the Lord. And this, of, of all four, I believe, is the most important. And so we're going to go a little bit backwards in the text to a verse that we skipped. Because this, this is a key one here. Nehemiah says, says that, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, 14, it says that, And I looked and arose, and I said to the nobles, and I said to the officials, and to the rest of the people, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Now, the people were discouraged because they, they'd gotten their focus off of, off of the Lord. They, they had consecrated their work to the Lord, but the discouragement had come, and they've got their focus on the discouragement, rather on the Lord who had been faithful. They got their threats, they got their thoughts on the enemy's threats, on the, on the rubble, on the, on the huge task that it was, all, all the work that was left to do. And Nehemiah rightly got their focus back upon the Lord. It says, remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And when, when opposition hits, it's easy to get your focus off the Lord and onto your problem, whatever you're going through right now. Where's your focus? Where's your focus? Because maybe you need to remember the Lord who is great and awesome and get your focus back on him. Such times, Paul says this, Colossians 3 verse 2, set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. Get God's perspective on your situation. Put your faith in the Lord. Now, in conclusion, as, as we end this chapter today, if you know Christ and if you're trying to accomplish something for him, maybe you're just trying to say, hey, I just, I just want to start off and just be obedient to God. And you're finding that every single day is a struggle. I heard somebody that wanted to come to church today, woke up, right? And immediately was discouraged. And they're not here. They're not here. Why? Because Satan is alive and well. Our adversary is alive and well. You know, the, the, you know it happens quite often sometimes. The worship team faces a lot of, a lot of struggles sometimes in the morning, right? You know, if, if you ever come at, at 8, 8.30 and just sit in on a practice, you'll hear sometimes we've got tech glitches, we've got problems, and, and, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, legitimately we can solve them, but, but sometimes we believe Satan is just trying to discourage us. Don't give in. Don't, don't keep your eyes on the problem. Don't keep your eyes on the discouragement. Maybe if you're dealing with health issues right now, maybe if you're like, man, I'm trying to live for God in my workplace, but everyone around me keeps on discouraging me, and I feel like I, f I feel like I shouldn't be here. I feel, feel like I feel like it's not right for me to to live as a follower of Jesus because nobody's going to support me. Get your eye off of off of this earth. Get your eye on the Lord, who's faithful. Now, let me tell you this: if you're not ready for opposition, for your obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. Are you ready for opposition? Are you ready to fight? Put on the armor of God. Trust in him. Lift your voice in prayer. Keep putting your hands to work. Keep watch for the enemy. And lastly, put your faith in the Lord. Put your faith in the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. I'm going to, at this point, just uh, invite uh, the band as we move into our time of communion together to, to come on up and Logan and, and DJ, um, you guys can come on up. And as, as they do, as, as we end our service today, as we've remembered this last line from Nehemiah, remember the Lord, that's what we have an opportunity to do, don't we? We're going to partake of communion here in, in just a few minutes. And the big, the big word that we, we use with communion is the word remember, because that's what it's all about. We remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And let me just ask you this, this last point that we just went through. 
Let me ask you, have you put your faith in the Lord? Have you personally trusted in Him as your Lord and Savior? You may be like, I, I, I don't know what that's all about. Can I just tell you quickly before we take communion? Because this is part of what we remember. We remember first, my sin and your sin separates me and separates you from a holy God. Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. And that's, that's not just, I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried and that's the end of life. No, we, we believe, Scripture says, that uh, all of life, it's, it's not, you know, this, this 70, 80, 90 years that we get, it's just, it's just a vapor, but eternity is to come, that we're eternal. And either we're going to spend eternity with God in heaven, or we're going to spend it in a place of condemnation in hell. What Scripture says is that the wages of sin is death, what we deserve for our sin. What we deserve for, for mocking God, for, for playing the role of harlot. So we deserve hell. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. But praise God, it, it, it didn't end there, right? Just like the walls were rebuilt, they took these, these stones that were burned and, and worthless, and, and, and the people took them and they built them into a new structure, and the, the, the rocks were redeemed. So we need a redeemer. We're broken. We're separated from God. We're, we're, we're busted, okay? There's no way for us to get to heaven. So Jesus Christ, he came and he became our redeemer. He took us in our brokenness. <laughs> Scripture says that while we were still sinners, burned, busted, separated from God, while we were still sinners, Scripture says Christ died. For us. He loves you so much that he came and he laid his life down for you. And you may be wondering, what in the world did he do there? Well, scripture also says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness. And what Jesus did is he shed his blood on your behalf. He took the wages of sin that you deserve he took him upon himself. He died. He died for you. And you remember that because he was the only perfect lamb of God that could do that for you. And you receive it. I'm going to just share with you a couple of scriptures that, that really help us to remember what Jesus did. And, and if you want to use these to respond to him, I, I encourage you to do so. It says in Isaiah 53 verse 5 that he was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Acts 16, verse 31, if you want to receive Jesus, it says this. When, when, when some people were asking, they responded to say, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's simple as that. That if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you take that step of faith today? Would you place your faith in the Lord? Because Jesus said this, he said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You may be depending on some other way to get you there, being trying to be a good person, trying, trying to come to church and, and live a moral life. But Jesus said, no, I'm the way. You realize you're that broken stone. You realize you need a redeemer that you can't build the walls of your, <laughs> your life up yourself. You can't do it. You need Jesus to do it for you. Say, Jesus, I believe. I believe. So we enter into this time of communion. I want to just use a time of silence for us to remember. And some of you, you need to respond. To respond today to say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. Let's use this moment right now, just in the silence, before we partake of the bread and of the cup, to do that right now as a church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Jesus, 
for calling people to yourself today. Whether they're watching online or here in this room, God, I pray that as they put their faith in you, Lord, that, that you would surround them, you'd bring them into your family as you promised, God. And Lord, as we remember your goodness and your faithfulness today, Lord, we would not forget that we would not forget and that we would lift our voices in prayer. We would put our hands to work, that we would watch out for the enemy. And God, more than anything, we would keep our faith in you, our Lord and Savior. Pray this all and thank you for the cross and for Jesus Christ. Pray this in your name. Amen.